I thought I would do is I would focus on the genetic syndromes because all I ever do now you know, clinically has to do with inherited arrhythmias. And so um, I thought these are the things I would really focus on. So these are the things that we uh, address in, in, this, in the 2017 uh, ACC to AHA guidelines. Uh, we'll talk about congenital QT. Uh, and I know Dr. Doppelfudi did a really nice job earlier today. Um, Brigada syndrome, CPVT, uh, the J-wave syndromes, early repolarization, short QT, and then I'll talk briefly about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and uh, ARVD. So if you think about the cardiac action potential, um, you, here's some normal action potential here. And here's a patient who has an action potential with uh, prolongation of the QT interval. The QT interval can prolong by a variety of ways. One is if you have increased uh, inward sodium current or increased L-type calcium current in the plateau phase, that will prolong the action potential. And indeed, these are mutations in, in uh, genes that code for these currents do cause uh, long QT. Most long QT, though, are related to outward potassium currents, either IKR or IKS, and sometimes in the IK uh, uh, acetylcholine sensitive current. So we'll talk ab about uh, some of these. Now, this is a uh, typical EKG from a patient with long QT1. Long QT1 uh, is uh, uh, about, about a third of the patients that we'll see with long QT. And what you can see is there's a very long QT here, but it's just kind of a broad-based T wave. There's nothing funny about these T waves. They're just very broad-based. So this is long QT1. This is due to a genetic <laughs> defect in the gene that codes for the uh, delayed rectifier current that uh, codes for IKS. Um, the slow component. Um, this, on the other hand, is long QT2. Long QT2 is uh, related to uh, decreased current of, of the uh, rapid component of the delayed rectifier. And the EKG here is, this is very characteristic. You see the notches on the T waves. That is very characteristic of long QT2. Now you can't always be sure by looking at the, at the EKG, but when you see a kind of a notch like this, you can be pretty confident that this is the long, key, long QT2. Long QT3, it really looks like a patient with hypocalcemia. What you see here is the T wave really looks okay. It's just that the ST segment has been moved out. This is the kind of thing you see with someone with hypocalcemia, for example. And this is due to a, 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 a gain of function mutation where there's increased uh, of the inward sodium current. And so the, it, this is kind of a uh, form of renolazine poisoning that's, that's congenital uh, with increased late uh, sodium current. Now, Sometimes we have some bizarre mutations. This is one of uh, Dr. Lau's patients that we, we saw who has, um, you see here, two to one AB block. And this is kind of a bizarre EKG. These are P waves. Here is the T wave. That T wave goes with that QRS. The QT interval here is 750 milliseconds, uh, you know, c close to the world record. And what you see is the QT interval is so long that it causes two to one heart block. This is a, this is a little baby who has uh, calmodulin mutation uh, that we uh, published. Unfortunately, this, this baby also had a uh, severe uh, defect in um, contraction, had a very low ejection fraction, ended up dying. Um, it's very difficult to pace. If you think about putting in a pacemaker, if you pace right after that, that P wave that's blocked, you're still in the T wave, so it's, it's almost impossible to capture. And so um, we, you know, we tried pacing uh, epicardially, it, it just doesn't work because that QT is, is so long. Fortunately, these are, that, that's a very rare mutation. So the mutations that we see in long QT syndrome are either gain of function mutation with inward currents, so a gain of function of uh, inward sodium current or inward calcium currents, um, and these are in, in uh, kind of in the green here, or loss of function mutations in the outward the polarization current. So the IKS, IKR, and sometimes in the uh, uh, L-type pl plateau current. These are the mutations we see. But of these, the ones that we see most commonly would be IKS, IKR, 
and the uh, inward sodium current. So let me show you what those are. So if you take uh, long QT syndromes, um, the incidence is about one in 2,000 babies. The data we have are from Italy, from Peter Swartz, uh, who's been a giant in this field. And he looked at uh, genotyping in Italy. It's about one in 2,000 infants have some form of long QT syndrome that, that can be identified genetically. Among those, so about 75% of the patients are going to have uh, a defect in either LQT1, 2, or 3. Um, and, and of those, uh, they're, they're about e evenly matched. 25% um, of the patients, unfortunately, don't have any recognized mutation. They have some mutation, we just don't know what it is. Again, LQT1 is due to a loss of function mutation, and you have decrease uh, of the uh, delayed rectifier, the, the uh, slow component. LQT2, again, is loss of function mutation in the, in the rapid component of the delayed rectifier current. And long QT3 is due to a gain of function of SEN5A, which controls the uh, inward sodium current. Um, so you can think about LQT1 and LQT2 as kind of a, um, as kind of a type 1A uh, antiarrhythmic drug. So this is like procainamide. You can think about long QT3 is something that delays the uh, late uh, uh, sodium current, like renolazine would be kind of a, an example of that. So how do you diagnose long QT syndrome? Let me tell you, sometimes it can be challenging. And uh, I must say that I admit that I made some errors, sometimes being overly aggressive here. But what you do is take a meticulous history, okay? Syncope, and especially seizures. When you see children that have, um, typically children have seizures, have syncope, will come in with a story, I had a seizure, or my child had a seizure. Really be careful about seizure history in children, because oftentimes it's actually ventricular tachycardia, torsade. Unexplained accidents or drownings. So if you hear dr unexplained drowning, think long QT1. Of course, aborted, aborted certain cardiac death. Um, and sometimes we'll see pay, people who have a family history of, you know, uh, my cousin died at age 13. Uh, they just found him dead. We just don't know what he had. Um, uh, so you, you have to take that family history. Uh, you look for precipitating factors, things like emotion. So um, if someone gets very excited and, and, and uh, has syncope, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a worrisome clue. Someone that is exercising. So we see a kid, when Dr. Lau and I see a kid who passes out with exercise, take that very, very seriously. That's almost always a, a malignant ventricular arrhythmia. Um, Long QT1 is characterized by swimming. So if someone has, uh, is swimming, we had a, a child just uh, last two weeks that was swimming in a uh, swimming meet and as she turned in the Dakota, you know how they do to cut around, uh, she passed out and fortunately was resuscitated. If uh, you have a loud auditory stimuli, a, you know, classic school bell rings and the child passes out, think long QT2. Uh, long QT3 oftentimes is during sleep. And then, of course, the family history is important. The 12 lead ECGs is, is obviously crucial. Now, if the, long, if the QT interval is greater than 450 milliseconds in a, in a boy, that is abnormal. In a girl, girls have a little longer QT. So 460 uh, is what we would say is, is abnormal. Um, the problem is this. If you look at the Mayo Clinic data, uh, this is the long QT population. And some people with, with confirmed, genetically proven long QT syndrome will have a normal QT interval. Even down here, you look at 470 milliseconds, they have some. So there are some people with long QT syndrome that actually have a normal QT. And on the flip side, this is the normal population. So men here in solid, women in, in the dotted line, you see women have a slightly longer uh, QT interval than men. Estrogen has that effect. Androgen shorten the QT interval. Um, but there's this overlap group, so you have to be really careful. If you see someone with a QT interval of 450 or 460, they might have long QT syndrome. They might be normal. They might be just in the, in the tail end of this the bell curve. Um, so you got to be careful. And what that requires is that you do a, um, a careful history and physical. And so uh, this is the point score that we kind of lose. Now, if you have more than three and a half points, that's very high probability 
that you've got congenital long QT syndrome. If you've got less than one point, it's very low probability. And of course, the problem is oftentimes right here somewhere in the middle. So if the QT is 480 milliseconds or more, you get three points. Because it's, that's essentially making a diagnosis of long QT syndrome. But if it's in this, in this intermediate range, in, in, in boys a little bit shorter than girls, oftentimes that's difficult. And you only get one or, or, or two points. Documented torsade gets you two points. T-wave alternance, uh, uh, only one point, although that's, I think, is very helpful. Um, clinical history of syncope with stress, two points, without stress. So when you see, when you see kids, I mean, how many kids do you see who have bagel, vasovagal syncope? You've got to be really careful that you don't make a diagnosis inappropriately of long QT syndrome. Congenital deafness, um, very rare, but is a very malignant form, uh, the dravel lang nielsen syndrome of long QT syndrome. Uh, family history of patient with a family history of, of clear long QT syndrome gets one point, and then unexplained sudden death less than 30 gets you half a point. So you have to use the history very carefully and the EKG because both of them go go together. Now here's an example of someone with a genetically proven long QT one. Uh, this is uh, from the Mayo Clinic, and I think any of us looked at this EKG, we would say that's a normal EKG. And yet here is the same patient with episodes of torsade, um, clearly a malignant form of, uh, of uh, long QT syndrome, even though the baseline QT is normal. So, when you, so that brings up the genetic testing. And when genetic testing, I want to really say you've got to be careful. 4% of, of Caucasians will carry a uh, amino acid altering variant of one of these uh, three long QT, one, two, or three genes. It doesn't mean it's a, um, it's just a normal allele, but uh, you've got to be careful that you don't overdiagnose that. And don't screen people who have clear vasovagal syncope. If you do that, you're going to start making the diagnosis of long QT syndrome, and it messes up the whole family. So what you do is you, is you do it only when it's appropriate. When there's an index of suspicion is high based on the history, the family history, the EKG, uh, probably should do it anybody who has a QTC uh, of at least 480 milliseconds, regardless of anything else. And then relatives of an individual with a proven long QT syndrome, you ought to, you ought to screen them as well because they, they might harbor a mutation with a normal QT interval, so you can't just depend on the EKG. So this is kind of what it looks like when you get the report back. So this is, uh, there's several uh, reporting uh, companies that you can use. This is one called GeneDX, um, and this is just from one of our patients who has a, a mutation in KCNQ1. This is long QT1, and this is, uh, which is a heterozygous, this is autosomal dominant, so it's heterozygous, and the classification is pathogenic variant. So this is, in other words, this is the real deal. When you see this, you know this is a pathologic mutation. So the interpretation, this individual is heterozygous. Again, this is a autosomal dominant, so it's, uh, it's important for a missense variant of, uh, of long QT1, okay? So they, they've, you can be pretty sure that this patient has a confirmed long QT1 syndrome. But look at this one, and oftentimes you'll get reports back like this. So you know, these are all the genes that were evaluated, like every gene you can think of, and you get this one. So, so they've got, a, they've got an, a mutation in Ankerin uh, 2, but it's a variant of unknown significance, and they're heterozygous. What do you do with that? It's very hard to know. What you don't do is tell the patient you've got a genetic defect. This may be a normal um, variant that we that you know four to six percent of us carry, and so you've got to be very careful. Don't overinterpret these things that are um, uh, unknown significance. Okay, that's that's the that's the bottom line. You've got to you've got to be very careful, and so it raises the issue of having genetic counseling. If you're going to deal with this, you better have someone that, that uh, you can send them to to do uh, to genetic counseling, so that the patient and their family isn't told. Um, that they have uh, this terrible mutation, which may be nothing, okay? Really important. Well, the baseline QTC uh, is kind of very, is most important in figuring out the risk. This is patients with long QT uh, syndrome confirmed genetically 
who have a prolonged QT. And this is the risk of aborted sudden cardiac death or, or uh, aborted cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death. You see, it's quite significant. Now, here's another patient who has a um, long QT syndrome, genetically proven, but still a normal QT. And you see the, the, that diagnosis carries a much less severe prognosis. So the QTC clearly is the, is the most important. On the other hand, this guy who's carrying this mutation, as I showed an example of, who has a normal QT, still has a higher risk than someone in the family that doesn't carry the mutation. So yes, this is better, but it's, and it's not as bad as if the QT is prolonged, but um, still uh, it carries some risk. So you have to be careful. Now, looking at um, long QT1 and long QT2, long QT2 has a little worse prognosis, not terrible, but, uh, but the risk of sy syncope is a little higher. And uh, one thing that's important is this is the risk of syncope in someone who is genetically negative. So this is the cousin who has a, his normal genome but you see 10%, but 10, 12% of them still have syncope. It's vasovagal syncope. It's all the stuff that they, what their kids get. But if you look at abort, aborted cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death, having a negative genotype really kind of rules out uh, the risk of sudden cardiac death. But long QT2 carries a worse prognosis than long QT1. So you have to remember that. And so generally we treat long QT2 a little more aggressively the long QT1. Long QT1 does much better with beta blockers. Long QT2 doesn't quite do as well as beta blockers. So we would be more likely to take this patient with long QT2 and offer him alternative therapies, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. So if you look at genetic analysis, if you look at long QT uh, syndrome proven, uh, genetically proven, who has a prolonged QT, their risk of dying suddenly is 36 times higher than a gene negative family member. If you look at a, a long QT, um, genetically proven long QT uh, person who has a normal QT, they still have a tenfold higher risk of sudden death than a gene negative uh, uh, family. And again, if you look at the person with, again, these are all genetically proven long QTs, but the guy's got the normal QT versus the long QT, his risk is less than a third. So having a longer QT clearly uh, is, is bad. So how do we treat it? Well, you treat long QT syndrome um, with beta blockers. And, and this is a uh, important study looking at the effectiveness of beta blockers. And what I want to tell you is this. Um, these are all people with long QT1 or, Q, or long QT2 genetically proven, treated with beta blockers. And this is the risk of uh, a cardiac event versus um, before they were on beta blockers. The only drug that's effective in long QT2 statistically is Natalol. Natalol is by far the best drug, and, and there are several reasons for that. One is that it's a um, nonspecific beta blocker, has a very long duration of, half, uh, of action, about 30 hours. And so if you think about t treating teenagers with drugs, if you give a teenager a drug they've got to take three times a day, the compliance is, approaches zero. But they can take Natalol because even if they miss it for 12 hours, you know, they, uh, still you've got a good effect. So Natalol is by far the best drug to use. Now, unfortunately, no, none of us use Natalol very much for uh, as routine beta blockers, unfortunately. And so unfortunately, the manufacturer of generic Natalol is talking about not making it anymore, which will be a disaster for long QT group. Well, what do you do if someone has uh, a very malignant form of long QT syndrome or, or fails beta blockers? Well, what you can do is a left uh, sympathectomy. Here's, here's the cell ganglion, and uh, this is a, from a thoracoscopic approach. So now it's actually a very, um, from the doctor's standpoint, it's a very simple procedure. This is a through a thor thoracoscope, and what you find is, is here you can uh, identify, uh, here's, here's the T2 uh, ganglion, and um, if you do this through a thoracoscope, if you divide the stellate ganglion at the bottom portion of it, you can prevent Horner syndrome. And very, very effective. So um, if someone fails with long QT syndrome, fails um, a beta blocker, this would usually be our second line of, of therapy, is to do a left uh, uh, sympathectomy through a th uh, thoracoscope. 
Now, these are the guidelines that will be coming out next month. And, he, and so, if you take a patient with long QT syndrome, if they've had a cardiac arrest, you treat them with a beta blocker, and if they're a defibrillator candidate, just treat them with a defibrillator. Class one indication. So that's pretty easy. If you only have, to, as Dr. Plum said, you only have to die once. So that's what we would do. Now, if they have recurrent shocks from their defibrillator, that's the person we would consider doing a left uh, sympathetic uh, sympathectomy on. That was, so we would uh, certainly t have them go to the surgeon and do uh, left sympathetic uh, chain uh, uh, ablation. Now, if you have long QT syndrome, but you've not had a cardiac arrest, if, you, if your QTC is less than 470, we have a class 2A indication to treat you with a beta blocker. Again, Natalol. If you don't remember anything else today, remember Natalol. Um, patient has persistent symptoms, then you need to get more aggressive. And we would, we would then usually send the patient for left cardiac sympathetic denervation uh, and think about defibrillator. Now, if you have a patient with a uh, long uh, QT, 470 milliseconds, treat them with a beta blocker. Uh, if they are asymptomatic and their QT is greater than 500 milliseconds, we would consider that patient for uh, left sympathectomy and or ICD. So that's a class 2B indication. But I think most people would, would consider that. And of course, you always want to avoid hypokalemia and, and drugs that prolong the QT because that's a, a class 3 or a harm. Um, Okay, so now we'll move on then to Brugada syndrome. This is classic Brugada type one. Uh, Dr. Uh, Doppelpudi talked about this. You see uh, ST elevation with a coved um, negative here uh, T wave. This is a classic um, type one Brugada syndrome. This patient is at risk for uh, sudden cardiac death. Um, now, Brugada EKGs come in kind of three variants. We have the classic type one, and for, for, for your um, uh, standpoint, this is the only one you need to really worry about. We, for someone with a, with a saddleback type with some ST elevation or saddleback with no ST elevation, we generally wouldn't do anything unless they have a history of syncope. And then we, we might try to provoke them by giving uh, a drug such as uh, flecainide challenge. But for the most part, uh, these, this type one is the only type that we actually uh, would be concerned about. Now, you can convert a type uh, one or a normal, or sorry, two or three to, to, norm, to a type one by either fever, and that's one of the things that people with Brugada syndrome, you really have to avoid, because if they develop a fever, that actually will aggravate this. And there's a number of kids, will, or young adults, will die suddenly uh, in the presence of a fever. So you have to treat fevers very aggressively. Or anytime you have a sodium channel blocker, for example, uh, flecainide in this country, Asmolin would, would be around the world, uh, you can convert a, a relatively normal EKG to a classic type 1 Brugada uh, syndrome. So Brugada syndrome is um, often due to a mutation of SCN5A. This controls the inward sodium current, but that's only a quarter of the patients, okay? So most people with Brugada syndrome, we don't know what the mutation is. Only a quarter of them will have a, uh, a, a mutation of SCN5A. It's an autosomal dominant inheritance, but low penetrance. So you can, you can have in the same family, same gene, one guy's got a normal EKG and then the other, the brother has a, has a, a, a classic uh, Brugada. Um, there have been over a hundred different mutations identified for the same gene. But unfortunately, again, two to five percent of the healthy individuals have some variation, a normal allele in the SCN5A. So if you, you, you can't test people willy-nilly because you run the risk of taking two to five percent of the normal population and telling them they got Brugada syndrome, and that's not true. Um, there is a particularly um, malignant form of, uh, of uh, calmodulin mutations, which is rare. And there's 15 other genes, but most people with this don't have any recognized genotype. The important thing about Brugada is it really is male dominance. Nine times more likely to have the Brugada phenotype, the EKG, in males than females. And that's probably because of, of the testosterone effect. Fever, as I said, in sodium channel blockers will make it worse. Um, it often has significant myocardial fibrosis and conduction slowing on the epicardial surface of the RV alpha tract, and that's associated with v, VT and VF, as I'll show you. Now, so what's the mechanism of VF? 
Um, here are, this is a wedge perforation uh, in, in uh, the mouse where this, uh, the mouse was given uh, a terfenidine, which blocks both in inward sodium and the L-type calcium currents. And here you see on the RV alpha trap, here is the here's the endocardium, normal uh, action potential, here's the epicardium. And so we have kind of unopposed uh, inward, um, or the outward ITO current. And that can lead to what's called uh, phase two reentry. Here's phase two reentry and induction of ventricular fibrillation in this, um, in this Brigada. Uh, this is an experimental model. Now, if you ablate the RV alpha tract, if you go on the, outs on the epicardial surface of the RV alpha tract and you ablate that, what happens is you basically, you normalize uh, the action potentials. And that has led to a clinical uh, tool, and that is catheter ablation. Now, how do you predict prognosis? Well, it all depends on how they present. If the patient has a Brugada EKG, and again, this is a, a, a published uh, from Japan of 200, uh, in 2013, they had, they had 69 patients, 66 males. It's a huge male predominance. Um, the, so if, you've had, if you're asymptomatic, your risk is actually pretty low. If you have syncope, your risk is significantly higher, about, 12, about 11 percent per year. And if you have, of course, if you presented with VF already, you, you've got a uh, risk of, uh, that's, that's much higher, of 11% uh, risk of, of uh, recurrent events. Uh, if, so if you've had a, one event that gets a defibrillator, if you have syncope, you ought to think about a defibrillator. If you're asymptomatic, for the most part, we probably leave you alone. Now, does it make a difference whether you have a spontaneous or, or a uh, drug-induced EKG, Brigada EKG. So these are a whole bunch of different studies looking at the risk of, of sudden death if you have a spontaneous ECG. This is from the first paper by the Brigada brothers, and you looked very high. But subsequently, the risk is actually not that high if you have a spontaneous Brigada asymptomatic uh, patient. If it's, if it's only drug-induced, the risk is extremely low. Okay, so, so we wouldn't really put a defibrillator in someone with just a drug-induced uh, Brigada EKG unless they have a kind of a malignant story, uh, syncope. Now this is what it looks like on the, um, uh, on the uh, uh, EKG, on the uh, intracardiac electrograms. Here is the, here's a patient, this is the RV alpha tract. Here, here's what the electrogram looks like on the, on the endocardium. It looks normal. This is a normal electrogram on the inside. But look what the electrogram looks like on the epicardial surface. It's very fractionated. Uh, and that's because there's tremendous fibrosis in this region. And that seems to be where uh, VF occurs in most of these patients is from the RV alpha tract. So if you have a patient with Brigada syndrome that's, that has recurrent shocks from their defibrillator, you can do an epicardial ablation and ablate these uh, fractionated electrograms on the epicardial surface just underneath the pulmonic valve. And that's very effective in preventing, uh, uh, preventing recurrences. Um, okay, so if you have a patient with Brigada syndrome, and uh, they have a, a type 1 EKG. Um, you can consider um, uh, genotyping them, class 2B. If they have a, um, suspected Brigada syndrome and they, and they don't have a uh, classic type 1, do a pharmacologic challenge. Now, if they've had a history of cardiac arrest, they get a defibrillator. If they don't, for the most part, we just observe them without therapy. Now, some people will do an EP study because it does appear that if you have an inducible BT or VF with one or two extra stimuli, um, your risk is a little higher. But, but what EP study is useful for is if it's negative, your risk is extremely low. So uh, most people don't do EP studies, but if you had somebody that was really worried, if you did an EP study and it's negative, you can pretty much uh, reassure them not to worry. I want to talk about just another uh, couple of syndromes. One is CPVT. This is a classic uh, catecholaminergic polymorphous VT. Here's a patient uh, on a treadmill. This is one of our patients. And on a treadmill, this patient has syncope and now presents with this, uh, this bidirectional VT, very 
polymorphous ventricular tachycardia. Here's classic bidirectional BT. Now, in the old days, we'd call this ditch toxicity, right? Looks like calcium overload. It's the same mechanism. We have bidirectional BT, kind of beautiful EKG uh, uh, in this uh, person. Um, now, this is uh, a syndrome that has life-threatening polymorphous VT, bidirectional VT, or VF. It's usually induced by exercise and emotion. It comes in two variants. One is CPTB1, which is autosomal dominant, which is the most of these patients. It's due to mutation in the reanidine receptor. Um, CPV2 is an extremely malignant form. This is homozygous, and it's due to cal calsequestrin mutations. Uh, and so, so about uh, 60, about 70 percent of these patients will actually have uh, identifiable mutation. Um, the treatment, uh, beta, beta blockers of the treatment, again, natalol is the, is the best treatment. Um, for those who don't respond to natalol, fleconide, which blocks inward sodium current and the reanimate receptor, is the way to go. I would be very careful about putting a defibrillator in someone with CPVT because we and others have uh, unfortunately found out that if you put a defibrillator in a kid with CPVT, they have a shock, they get a big catecholamine surge, and they just have incessant VF. So be very, very careful about that. We would always, almost always go to um, treat them with uh, beta blockers and probably left uh, stellate uh, uh, sympathectomy before we would think about a defibrillator. Um, and we'll just go one more, uh, one more case. This is early repolarization. This is a kid that Dr. Lau and I uh, had uh, last uh, two weeks ago. A 15-year-old kid, early repolarization. I think any of us would see this. You know, if you see somebody in the ER with this, and they come in with, I don't know, some non-cardiac, you'd ignore it, right? You'd ignore it, especially if they're a black man, you'd, you'd ignore it. This kid uh, went to gym class and was standing around, wasn't actually exercising, and, um, Unfortunately, this is the AED. So they had an AED in the school, and here is ventricular fibrillation. And they shocked him. You see some little short runs of VT, but fortunately, the kid uh, came out okay uh, with this. Uh, and this is a problem because most of the time, uh, early repolarization is benign. But in this report we, from 2008, Michelle Hasegare reported that sometimes you'll see people have VF, as I showed. And the EKG, um, uh, can be, well, the point I want to point out is this. Early re repolarization is, a, is associated with a two times risk of sudden cardiac death if you're white or Asian. But if you're black, it doesn't seem to have any, uh, any statistical association. So if we see a, a, a black man, uh, or usually a young adult, with, with early repol, the most, and asymptomatic, we leave him alone. If we see a white person uh, with early repol or asymptomatic, we leave them alone. So here's the recommendation. Asymptomatic patient with early repolarization, don't do anything. And patients who have early repolarization, who've had a cardiac arrest, we put a defibrillator in. And unfortunately, there is no genetic testing that we uh, have. So I guess at that, I will probably uh, stop and entertain any questions that you have. No. So the question is, is there, is there a role for sodium channel block fleconide uh, in, in long QT syndrome? Yeah. Um, so that I showed that kid with the uh, with, with two to one heart block. We treated that kid with fleconide. Um, and um, the QT shortened a little bit. Still had two to one heart block. But sometimes people with long QT3, you can use um, Fleconide, and so that would be worth doing. Long QT one or two, probably no value, but long QT three, and that that brings up the point of how important it is to do genetic testing. Um, I have, uh, in fact, if you could show my last slide, could you could you do that? I want to just give you um, kind of ways to do genetic testing. We have uh, we use different uh, groups for this, uh, and I'll I'll show you the uh, groups that you can call upon to do this. You've got to be very careful. Dr. Lau told me that uh, he had a, uh, uh, used a company uh, that did, they did long uh, QT testing, made the diagnosis of long QT syndrome, and then, uh, unfortunately, the company called, the kid had a cardiac arrest, by the way. Kimpany, the company called the family and told them, oh, this is a, this is a gene that wasn't of uh, pathologic significance. Kids already had a cardiac arrest. So you've got to be careful about who you use. And I think that's why genetic counseling 
is, uh, can you go to the very last slide on the whole, the whole thing? Yeah, uh, I, I just, actually it's probably the next to last slide. I just want to show you the companies that you can use. Just skip right on through. Uh, we, we, uh, we, there are several ones we, we, you can use. Uh, just keep, there you go. That's it. Um, th these are how you can, uh, uh, you, now what's the cost of this? Uh, the commercial price for genetic testing of GeneDx is $6,500. But they do give you a break if you don't have insurance, you have Medicaid, it's, it's $1,500. I mean, it's still not cheap, but um, um, that, that's what the, the cost is. Insurance does cover it. Uh, yeah, and so that's why they jack up the price from $1,500 to $6,500, because insurance does cover most of it. Yes? Do you have an opinion, or is there an opinion of the consensus panel on the yeah, the question is, what's the role of quinidine in Brigada syndrome? And, and the answer is, it's, it's, it's worth doing. So if, if someone has a, a Brigada syndrome that has a, a defibrillator and has a shock, the first thing to do is to, to add quinidine. The second thing to do is to do epicardial ablation. Okay, so that would be the, the second thing. So quinidine would be fun. Quinidine is a ITO blocker, and that's why quinidine is, is the drug of, of choice there. Yeah, uh, I didn't talk about short QT, but we would use quinidine there as well. Uh, and, and even in, in uh, early repo, quinidine has probably got a role for it now. Kind of finding quinidine today is, is a challenge, but uh, yeah, that's what we would use.